Welcome to my micro lecture, Six Ambivalent Musings. As you'll find out later on, I'm a lover of titles. And in the midst of marking and writing feedback, I know that technically titles should be in italics or underlined. But in this case, it didn't feel right. There was something too uncertain in that slanting of words. Strange to say that, given the prominence of ambivalence in the centre there. You'd think the slope would help me reinforce the meaning of the title for my audience. But in some ways, meaning isn't the only thing at play here. In some senses, I was equally, if not more, interested in image, what the form had to say. On my keyboard, there are a number of bracketing possibilities, the soft and the curved, the ornate and flourishing, and the boxed and framing. I know all of them have a special function and say something different about the word that is held in their embrace, but I don't know what these differences are. I could find out, but I don't want to know. I went with what looked visually right, and though the bracketing of that word ambivalence in itself suggests further unresolvedness, the brackets chosen have a formality and strength to them, kind of saying, I want my ambivalence to be definite, asserted and unapologetic. Title analysis over, let's get to Musing 1. Late July last year, I ran a three-day workshop in Folkestone for performance space. The workshop was called Reveries on Visible Thinking. Process as performance, thought as action, reverie as method, with one provocateur, myself, and three participants coexisting in a real-time process room of mulling and mapping. Over these days, I generated some mullings myself. Amongst these was a series of six pieces I called Throat Thoughts. I was prompted to remember that as part of my Medea Dark Matter Events project, I had a strong desire to design a Medea adornment collection, creating pieces of throat jewellery, externalisations of throat anatomy to be worn on the neck. The materials for this endeavour sit and wait on my desk as I speak, unacted upon in a state of pause or silent accusation. In the Roman Catholic Church, there is a blessing of the throat sacrament in the name of Saint Blaise, the patron saint of throat diseases and illnesses of the voice. Numerous miracles were attributed to this saint including the cure of diseased beasts, which accounted for him also being the patron saint of wild animals. I wonder whether St Blaise talked to these beasts once he had cured their throat ailments. Did they chat and converse through grunts, roars, snorts, growls, barks, pants, howls, brays and neighs or hisses? But more of this later. I've been having trouble with my teeth lately, much cracking and crumbling. Some years ago, I had a dream where I was in a kind of installation with a number of peat boxes on display. For some reason, my eldest sister Deborah was there and asked me if I'd like to see her receding tooth. I said yes, and she opened her mouth. Peering inside, I saw that it was furnished with miniature chairs and tables furniture of the mouth. Is the mouth a theatre? 
Is the tongue a stage for other kinds of sweet and sour utterings? Are the vocal cords a curtain? Is the mouth a camera or a cave? In a funding application, I proposed a project called Looking into the Cave of Oration, filtered through the spirit of Renaissance hermeticist Giordano Bruno, the classical art of rhetoric and the operations of oratory. The mouth would be conceptually considered as a site of sin, blasphemy, heresy, profanity, prophecy, lies, passion, disease, truth, betrayal, salvation, persuasion, sustenance, disgust and expulsion. The anatomical and language forms of oratory would be transformed to produce objects and events constructed from and by the connected materials of the mouth, throat and nasal cavity, spit, saliva, mucus and phlegm. One of these events was titled Rhett or Rick. The proposition was to use Bruno's acts of rhetorical descent as a model with an artificial dialect constructed in relation to two classic films and the performances of their two leading male actors, Clark Gable as Rhett Butler in Gone with the Wind and Humphrey Bogart as Rick in Casablanca. With myself, the artist in the persona of Bruno acting as referee, the piece investigates styles of persuasion, seduction and the accent, the mythical errors of catchphrases and tropes and strategies of repetition. The funding application was not successful. The proposition remains on paper and in the imagination for the time being. In the Egyptian section of the British Museum, which I visited often, there's a cabinet displaying the tools and ritual implements used in the opening of the mouth ceremony. This part of the burial rite is conducted by a priest wearing a jackal-headed mask representing the god Anubis. The ritual is to open parts of the body to the senses enjoyed in life and needed in the afterlife. I did a Google search to see what the relationship between a jackal and a dog might be and another question came up on the information feed. Do jackals eat humans? That's certainly something to think about. Eating and understanding, devouring knowledge. The artist John Latham is the man who ate art and culture, masticating yet not swallowing, spitting out but not digesting Greenberg's book of the same name. What is Latham saying here? It's certainly appealing to me. On the subject of devouring, I read recently that fungi make soil by eating rocks. Bataille tells me that the kiss is the first stage of cannibalism. I've been thinking about developing a set of cutlery for cannibals utensils for satisfying the most extreme of appetites. I think they would need to be hewn from bone and skin and hair and sinew, spoons, forks, knives adapted and altered, made sacred or asceticized. Would these alterations be civilizing the cannibalistic drive, a papering over of founding acts of violence and cruelty, or as the poet Anne Carson might say, the victory of culture over monstrosity. But I found out last night when I was preparing this talk that the Fijians got there before me with their ceremonial forks for devouring the flesh of tribal rivals. I recently started following Clement Knives on Instagram. This is Tim Westley who makes his knives by forging the blades from discarded nitrous oxide canisters and the handles from recycled plastic. Perhaps there's the collaboration to be had if there was a market for the cannibal cutlery. Or 
Or maybe a knife made by wolf and dingo would be more apposite for the appetite. As an aside, I learned that inhaling nitrous oxide directly from the canister is very dangerous because the gas is under such high pressure. It can cause a spasm of the throat muscle and stop a person breathing. So we're back to the throat. What is that telling me? A few years ago, I was on the upper floor of a bus going north along the Tottenham Court Road. We stopped in traffic. I turned my head to look out of the window and at that moment I witnessed a woman trip and smash her head on a concrete pillar outside a shop. Concerned bystanders helped her up and into the shop. Through the bus window and through the shop window, I could see her getting care. On the pillar and pavement was blood. Later that day, I was on another bus, again on the upper floor, travelling east on the Old Kent Road. The bus came to a halt at the stop. At that moment, I heard a loud cracking noise as something hit the window next to me. Looking down, I could see two kids throwing bricks or stones at the bus. It was a shock, that moment of impact, of collision, of violence. Remembering these incidents that happened on the same day, I decided to make two intensity diagrams and two intensity models of these events, V1 and V2, velocity violence. What keeps me thinking about this is that these two events happened on the same day. In almost exactly the same circumstances. One was violence as a result of accident. The other was violence as the result of intention. What was it telling me? The artist Howardina Pindell takes photographs of sporting events directly from the TV screen and then overlays handwritten arrows and marks indicating some sort of forces of physics at work, speed, velocity, violence, collision. She cites the book of the Tao of Physics as an influence on this work. That book sits on my shelf, its energy and force palpable. My place in rural Portugal sits in three hectares of land and has two buildings, a studio barn and a small house, both made with rammed earth, walls half a metre thick. In recent years, in the outside space close to the dwellings, I've been building dry stone walls to create planting beds. These are constructed with stones that have been unearthed by the wild boars when they do their earth rootling and nose ploughing. Willem Flusser, in his chapter on the gesture of planting, calls gardening perverse, and this makes me smile. I kid myself that the walls I'm making for my perverse planting are an attempt to work collaboratively with the boars in a kind of creative coexistence on the nature culture spectrum, a constant area of research for me. I feel unsettled that these walls are perverse attempts at control and domestication of wild space. And every time I leave these marks of culture intact, I know that when I return, the wild pigs will have ploughed through and over them just doing their thing. Here is animal disturbance in action, but this is their home. I'm the guest, the interloper, the estrangero, merely a fleeting custodian. 
I sense Flusseur would be with the pigs on this one. The principles of rewilding, a vegetative succession and animal disturbance. I've been thinking of ways in which these principles could be applied to the creative process. Or maybe I should just hang out with the pigs and learn some things directly from them. The fourth and final episode of my reading room series was going to be called FFF to T, T and T, folding, fabricating and fashioning to tentacular thinking and troubling, sub subtitled a revolting reading room. It would be a mashup of text by three dead male authors, The Fold by Deleuze, Sartura Ressartures by Thomas Carlyle and The Fashion System by Roland Barthes. The three texts would have three performative female figures attached to them in combative coexistence. A fourth text by a living female author to run simultaneously over the above would be Donna Haraway's Staying with the Trouble. The space of this text, T, T and T, is inhabited by myself working with tentacular thinking, troubling and complexities. The three performative figures move towards this space and converge and or collide with, in, on, through, under this space. This space becomes a bewildering conversation pit, a composting hangout, a revolting mud muddle. There are a number of guest species invited into this space, both human and non-human. The modes of the T, T and T space could be highly charged, chaotic and wild, highly stylized, archly performative and aestheticized, highly casual, conversational and convivial, or simultaneous coexistent combinations of all the above. Covid made sure that this project didn't come to fruition, didn't live in a physical space, but perhaps this arrested development was a good thing to have happened. The project could remain speculative, in diagram and model form. The pleasure of the thinking and researching and conceptualising and the structuring phase in suspension and intact without having to move into the clumsy, approximate, disappointing stage of realisation. It also allowed me to not have to address the rumbling ethical issues about bringing non-human critters into the performing space. I knew I couldn't do this in reality, as there was no way I could gain consent from them to participate. Where was their agency among my humanly entitled desires of exple exploitation in the name of art. I was reminded of another unrealised project I'd outlined many years ago, where I would conduct interviews with domestic animals, a pig, a rabbit and a dog. The interviews would focus on questions about their ancestral wild twins, the boar, the hare and the wolf, in a conversation last week with Tiffany, my Queen Mary research buddy, we were discussing the book she's writing on friendship. I asked if she'd included animals in her research. We talked about the power of animal-human relationships and I said I thought it was something to do with the nature of touch, of tactile contact, of the calm of stroking, even for me, of licking. I mentioned my long-standing desire to work with animals and include them in performance projects, but that I hadn't done this because of these ethical and moral issues of consent. I told her about wanting to find a way to talk to animals about this. We sat on a log in hilly fields, watching the dogs with their humans, and contemplated what systems of communication would have to be conceived and developed for these interviews to be able to genuinely happen. What would they possibly look like, sound like? Thinking now, I imagine that I'd need to fashion some kind of vocal prosthetic. The anatomy of the throat, the mouth, the tongue, the teeth and the jaw would, I envisage, 
need to be radically recalibrated for this other language to be possible. To discover how and what this might be seems to me to be a worthwhile endeavour. In early July last year, and in my absence, there was a devastating fire that raged through the valley and surrounding hills of my Alentejo home. My sister Sasha sent pictures of the aftermath two days after. I didn't manage to travel back there until three months later. It's the smell that hits you, and then the blackness. But in just three months there was regrowth and green shoots sprouting from the charcoal trunks and branches of the cork oaks and olive trees. All my fruit trees miraculously survived, but strangely bore black fruit that had been cooked and shrunk in the heat of the fire. I picked black oranges, black almonds, black plums, black madronias, black pomegranates and black quinces. These carbon fruits are waiting for me on the table in my studio in the barn that used to be a house for animals. Will they become an alphabet, a carbon lexicon speaking of palingenesis? the concept of rebirth or recreation from the ashes, or become part of a simple grid system, just celebrating their new found form and aesthetic, or will they just wait, waiting for something necessary to emerge? I'm not sure if these musings constitute research, but these are current thinkings. This is what I'm swimming in. And my sense is, and has been for some time now, that I'm moving to a place of the speculative rather than the operative, working in diagrammatic or model form with ideas remaining as potentials or prototypes, never being fully realised, resisting the push towards becoming product, a kind of refusal. Or perhaps the next project is simply a list of titles of works full of potential for wonder and panic, but never executed. Titles like A Folded Body and an Abstract Beast, The Violet Phenomena Spectacles, Terror, Terror, A Harrowing, AAA an auditorium of animals in awe, a poetics of the brick, the mycelium erotics. Vinyl violences and vinyl silences, an obliteration of the groove. The titles seem enough. They could be the next thing or not. One title I've been toying with is Be Wilder or Be Wilder Meant. I'm content being in this state. To be wilder is meant to be. I'm happy to be in a necessary state of bewilderment. This micro lecture could have been called Six Bewildered Musings, perhaps. My desire is for thinking and making to remain in the domain of pleasure, for projects to exist simply for their own sake, to be allowed to be themselves, what they are, without having to serve any other agenda, to be experienced without explanation or mediation. Maybe Rilke articulates this better in his line that reads... Never nothing without no. Perhaps this desire is naive, simplistic, unrealistic, but maybe this is the wild pig in me speaking, in my earth-rootling and nose-plowing mode, just doing my thing. And to bring these musings to a conclusion, I was flicking through a book on the artist Agnes Martin the other day. The shut sun was shining into the room, onto the glossy pages, and one of the titles of the essays read, or so I thought,
Happiness is the goat. I contemplated this for a moment and decided, yes, I can go with that. It was only when I put on my glasses and moved the page out of the glare of the sun that I saw that it actually read, Happiness is the goal. I prefer the error of reading, the slippage of understanding, and the place that error took me to into my musing and reverie, and can affirm and reassert here that, yes, happiness is the goat. This has been the Research Micro Lecture, Six Ambivalent Musings, brought to you by Julia Bardsley. Thank you for your intention.